to you. Seems weird jumping up here without any kind of special music today. Y'all have spoiled me the last few weeks. Um, this is a story found in Luke, and it's a familiar story. It's a story about a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. The story picks up in Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. Not just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. You've got to get this in the natural. He was somebody. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a wee little man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree, same kind of tree with the leaves that Adam tried to hide in in the garden. He tried to hide so he could see him since Jesus was coming that way. He wanted to see Jesus, but he didn't want Jesus to see him. And verse 5 says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And that's what happens when you think that God doesn't want to see you and suddenly God acknowledges you and you find out, oh, God will speak to me. God, God's okay with me. He jumped down and he was ready to embrace God. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter because they weren't happy that Jesus was speaking with this turncoat, this chief tax collector who, who was one of them, a Jew, but he turned on them and had become a pawn of Rome. They began to mutter, say, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And if you were the chief tax collector, you were the chief sinner in their eyes. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Uh, we were traveling this weekend in parts of the country that I had never been in before. And it's amazing how you can take yourself out of your comfort zone and put yourself in another scenario and you don't realize what's important to you. You don't, you don't understand your security blankets, those kind of attachments in your life. You don't realize they're there till you put yourself in a scenario where you don't have them and then you realize them. And I've noticed that every time we go out of the country somewhere, especially the older I'm getting. Um, when I was a young man, I loved doing the missions in other nations. I love slumming the cities and exploring. And, and just uh, I've been on teams with older pastors, and I was the young guy back then. And I would want to go, go out at night and explore the culture, and they were wanting to stay in their hotel rooms where it was safe. And I couldn't relate to them. And now I've found that I've become one of those older pastors. And now as soon as we start to leave the country, my first thought is, what if we have a medical emergency? What do we do there? <laughs> I didn't used to think that way. And, and now I've found it's not just in third world countries that I go and think that. I, I, I find that it's that way also when I go into third world counties. <laughs> Jonathan, I have a new appreciation for your upbringing. Um, and a beautiful part of the country, don't get me wrong, I'm just having fun here. Um, hadn't been down through Grundy in years and has anyone seen the Walmart in Grundy? Lord have mercy. That was big city Walmart down there, man. Got a parking garage and everything. And, uh, and those roads, I was telling Kim this morning, you know, people get sick traveling on those roads down through there. And, and I actually was even getting queasy, and I was the driver. And went down, and we had to stay in Pikeville. Pikeville, Kentucky, because my race was in Williamson, and this may come as a surprise to you, but there's, there's not a lot of hotels in Williamson. There's the, the Mountaineer, which has been preserved in time for, oh, many, many years, and if we go back, we're going to hopefully get, get a room there, but you have to book almost a year in advance on that race, because it's a marathon, half marathon, 5K, all, all people come from 
all over the United States. And it, it was hard to find a, a West Virginia or a Kentucky tag there. They were from everywhere. In my race, I was the per first person in from the state of West Virginia in that race. They were from Michigan and Texas and all over the place. And, and it's just, it was just a different world. And, and we lost something as soon as we started into that neck of the woods, as soon as we got past Richlands and started down into the coal fields there, we lost something very significant to us. My daughter especially lost something very significant to her, and it radically affected her emotions. <laughs> she was in complete despair. We found out that AT&T must not be a primary carrier in the coal fields. We had zero signal. Like pretty much all weekend, we had no signal. And it was amazing, though, I have to admit, and I told my wife, we're down there, and, and, and suddenly we become so attached to having that thing that in an emergency situation, it's there, and suddenly, being down in the middle of nowhere, where you don't have that link back to help, and you could feel just a little bit of insecurity rising up in you. That is a very small thing for a very small period of time to lose and feel the effect. Losing things and finding things. Interesting how that ends up being a very important topic to God. Jesus, who is the full expression of God in the earth, when he speaks, what he says, what he talks about, he is expressing the heart and the mind of God in its purest form. This is how God thinks. These are the things that God thinks about. And isn't it amazing, as Jesus tells parable after parable, how God is thinking about losing things. Parables about losing something and the desperate seeking, trying to find that, and the incredible joyful celebration after you find that which was lost. It could be a coin in a house, sweeping the house until it's found. It could be the infamous story of a lost son and the great jubilation of a son who was lost and now is found. It's not just the parables, but all through the Bible, there are stories of losing things and God restoring it back to people. This is a story of Zacchaeus, and I talk about Zacchaeus a lot because it's incredible, the parallels in the story of Adam and Zacchaeus and you and I. And... Uh, Zacchaeus had lost something, and he had not realized he had lost something. Zacchaeus was a man who, who was driven like the average American to become something in life, to find his mark in life, to, to carve out his niche, to be able to look in the mirror and feel good about himself, to be able to, to look at his possessions and say, I have accomplished things, I have arrived, my life has mattered. He has become... Uh, a chief tax collector, uh, really one of the highest positions you could ever have in a nation under Roman rule. And he was a rich man, though he was a short man, which tells me he probably drove a really big pickup truck. <laughs> we used to laugh growing up how the shortest guys lifted their trucks the highest off the ground. It's a psychological thing. I don't want to get into that right now. But I'll bet you Zacchaeus had the tallest camel in Israel. <laughs> Zacchaeus, I've told the story so many times. He, his, he's accomplished much in life, but there's something inside of him and that, that just doesn't feel good. He's battling guilt. He's battling condemnation. Jesus is coming to town. He's curious. He's heard so many stories. He wants to see Jesus. He doesn't want Jesus to see him. He does exactly what Adam did. He hides in the fig leaves. And just like in the story of Adam, God sees Adam and says, Adam, <laughs> Jesus sees Zacchaeus hiding in the trees. And 
He says, Zacchaeus, come down from there. And then he said something that shocked everybody, including Zacchaeus. He said, because I want to go to your house today. Well, we know that story. I tell that story so often. It's such a significant story. But then at the end of telling the history of that story, the Bible proclaims, Luke says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to find what was lost. What was lost. And it's a very key word to theologians that has been grossly overlooked by, and, and, and I don't mean this in a mean way, but by uneducated pastors in pulpits who take so many scriptures and either take them out of context or water them down. They, they, don't, they don't preach the verse in context so you understand the explanation of that particular verse. And we in America, in American church, we're so guilty about that. We'll take the word lost and, and we will whittle that thing down to either your soul is lost or it's found. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. That's how we reduce that word lost. But that being the most significant term in the whole Bible, speaking about what it means for a man to be lost, is the one that, that God uses it in context to broaden it so much beyond the simplicity of you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. He broadens it into the realm of every person's life. When he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And no matter how you tear that word down um, in, in the Greek and, and try to explain it, it means exactly what has been translated, what was lost. What was lost. As usual, if you'll read whole passages, the explanations are usually found in those passages. And then Jesus begins to explain what was lost. And he begins to talk about being Abraham's seed. And what he's saying is Zacchaeus, for example, accomplished much with his life. He had riches. He had prestige in Roman eyes, at least. He was hated by the Jews, but he had become a big shot. But Jesus is saying, but you have lost what was important. I have come to save what was lost, to find what was lost, to save it and to restore it back to your life. He's saying, Zacchaeus, you have lost everything that I have predetermined for your life as Abraham's seed. Now, when God began to explain what Abraham's seed was in the Old Testament, he would explain it to Abraham himself, which was three generations before there was ever a nation of Israel. And he began to explain um, the seed of Abraham, which the New Testament explains it is those that are in Christ. It has nothing to do with natural Jews. It has everything to do with spiritual Jews, those who are in Christ. And God would explain to Abraham that he would have seed. It would multiply the earth. It would become the very people of God. And he would say, you will be set apart among all the peoples of the earth. You'll be set apart because you're going to walk in my favor. You're going to be blessed wherever you go. And people will be blessed because of you. That's how blessed you're going to be. That if they bless you, it's going to, come, it's going to return right back to them. He said, you're going to be so blessed that if anybody curses you, that's going to come back on them too. He was trying to explain to them they would be set apart. They'd be uniquely blessed in life. The context to God speaking to Abraham about his seed then would have to go clear back to Adam in the garden. Because everything that God was saying to Abraham about his seed was exactly what God was saying to Adam from the very beginning. You're going to be blessed. You're going to subdue the earth. You're going to rule. You're going to reign. As we see these things broken down theologically all through Scripture, we understand that, that being the seed of Abraham, being the children of God, means that we will walk in blessings that are very unique to the earth and not easily found in any other way except through God. There would be blessings of great joy in life, even in times of great suffering, something that would be unthinkable to the rest of the world. There would be, there would be blessings of great comfort, even in times of deep grief. 
uncommon to the rest of the world. There would be a sense of life, abundant life, just even though we may hunger and we thirst for more of God, still a, a sense of a great contentment in life where we're not restless and, and fidgety and just always searching for the next thing to try to make our life fulfilled. But, but there's already a fulfillment in our life. A sense of great purpose, even if we haven't become a, a high-ranking official in the land like Zacchaeus, that even if we're somebody that would not have what would be considered a great vocation, somehow in our own life we would sense great purpose, that God was using us for something significant. When the Bible says that Jesus came to save what was lost. We say, what well, was that? And we say, well, the human soul. But we have to understand it was more than the human soul. It was the very destiny of the human soul that he came to say. It is, a, it is a perverted watering down of the whole message of God to say this whole thing is about just saving people from hell and taking them to heaven. With God, it's a much bigger story than that. It's about God having children and those children be, become established in life to be separate from everybody else, wholly set apart. And even though they would walk through the exact same things that everybody else in life would walk through, they would not be the same. They would not respond the same. They would not see it the same. He was telling Zacchaeus, in the natural, you've gained much. But in God's world, you've lost a lot. And I've come to restore that to you today. If you watch this past week's Hump Day video, it's, you, you can see this is something that's just, it's on my heart right now. And I loved that story of the, the lady from Sweden who had lost her wedding band digging in the garden. Lost it. It was it was significant to her, something significant to her, to her life. And she's out there working the soil of life. You've got to see the imagery of that story. And she, she loses her wedding band. And, and maybe you've done that and you're not exactly sure where you lost it at. And she wasn't sure. She just knew it was digging in the garden. And she looked and of course she couldn't find it. 16 years later, She's pulling carrots, and there in the top of that carrot was her wedding band. That carrot had grown right up through it, and the, the picture is just incredible. And, and since then, there's been other stories uncovered just like that, and a lot of people trying to fake those same pictures, by the way. And I was just impressed with that story because that lady had lost something significant, um, but she stayed in the garden. She kept digging in the garden. She stayed in life, and one day what she lost was restored to her. I thought, what a picture of God. He restores. He restores. This passage in Joel is, the, is probably the, the biggest in-your-face passage about God being a, a restorer. It says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. He's saying, I sent this stuff on you to try to get your attention, but... I'm going to restore what's been lost. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. It's always amazing to me when I read this passage how he takes all these locusts and he, and he strips them down into different divisions. The old locusts, the young locusts, the packs of locusts, the ones running by themselves. And it never really, sometimes you miss the simplicity of God and what God's trying to say. And we were driving down the church this morning and I had that, that passage on my mind and it just suddenly, the epiphany, that these locusts, they're bugs. And God's simply saying, there's been many things in life that has come against you that's just bugging you. They're just bugging you. The things that bug you rob you. They steal from you. They, the things that bug you in life, they steal your joy. And they, they steal your life. They steal your mental health. They steal your relationships. And he's saying, but I will come and I will restore what all these things that have been bugging you in life, I'm going to restore that back to you. What a great promise. Especially in an American culture where we are so bugged. We're bugged by everything. 
Those of you who are being bugged by politics today, those locusts, they are eating at you, and you know it. It's robbing your joy. It's infecting your relationships. It's making you a pessimist. It's getting you all focused from your purpose. Some of you are experiencing that with your jobs and your vocations. Things going on in relationships. Just things that aren't working out in life the way that you thought it was. Maybe it's something you had and you lost. And now it's just bugging you because you lost that thing. It's bugging you so much that it's robbing you. And you're losing so much of what God has planned in your life. God, the great restorer. Context of this story in Joel is that if you will come back to me, let me come to your house like I want to go to Zacchaeus' house. If you'll just let me come back and invade your home, I'm going to restore everything that's been lost. What's been going on in your life the last few days, weeks, months, years? that you can go back and you can pinpoint specific things that have happened, began to happen in your life, that you know has robbed you. It has changed who you are. Things that have, have, have stolen your joy, stolen your peace of mind. A loss that has so robbed your soul that you, you're, you're so buried in sorrow and grief and, 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 it, and it has robbed you of the life you once knew. A disappointment. A broken dream. A broken relationship. A lost relationship with a spouse, with a parent, with a child. You lost something. And it appears that the father is very, very focused on helping you find it. Here's what the psalmist said about God helping us find lost joy. He said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The psalmist said this because he had lost his joy. If you know this particular psalmist story, you know why he lost his joy. Because he had, a, he had a, a place of great elevation in life, great stance, great position, praised by people. And then he's on the run, he's on the lamb, he's hiding in caves. His life is not what it used to be. He lost what he once had. Everything from the house he was living in, the prestige, the position, uh, the, the fame, uh, the wealth. And now he's on the lamb, he's on the run, and, and he is noticing that it's not the things that he has lost that is the most important thing now. He has lost his joy in life. You can have nothing else in life but have joy and you're good to go. But you can have everything else in life and no joy. And you're to be pitied among all men. The psalmist says, restore to me the joy that comes with your salvation, with knowing you. Restore it to me, Lord. The story of Job. A man way beyond any of us that can relate to loss. Loss that would bring grief and sorrow because he lost children. He lost their lives. He lost crops. He lost his, his means of survival. He, he lost houses, barns. See, he lost stuff in life. He was losing his own health. But I like what God does in the very end of the story with Job because it's the nature of God. And after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. That's the restore God. He steps into our lives and he says, I will restore to you not even what you've lost, but even more than what you've lost. How, Lord? Lord? What's the key? What's the three steps? Where's the book I need to read? Jesus, the full expression of God in the earth. 
made it so simple. He simply said, come out of that place that you're hiding and let me go to your house. What he said to Zacchaeus is the simple approach of God. There's no trying to make amends. There's, there, there's no 25 steps. He says to us in our loss, just like he said into Zacchaeus' loss, he said, just come out from hiding in all that mess and let me come to your house. I will restore everything that, that has been lost, all these things that have been bugging you, things that have devoured your life like locusts. I'm ready to restore it even beyond what you lost. As a pastor and a counselor for many, many years, I have seen how easy it is for people to hide in their loss. We don't think about it that way. If I say, are you hiding in your loss? You'll go, oh, no, I'm not hiding in my loss. But if I say, are you hiding in your grief? Then you go, oh, maybe. Are you hiding in your anger? Uh, are you hiding in your disappointment? Uh, are you hiding in your brokenness? I've seen how quickly we can develop those things into new identities, in fact. And we can become so everything from agitated to calloused in those conditions that, in fact, we, we, we embrace those identities. We feel like we are justified and have a right to those things, and we'll get angry if someone tries to take it away from us. When you fall into the pit of loss in life, it's hard to pull up and see and remember what life was like before you fell in the pit. Jesus said, step one, stop hiding in that mess. Stop hiding in your loss. Stop seeing that as part of who you are. It's surrounding you. I see you. I see through the leaves. I see through the camouflage. I see through the pain. I see through the brokenness. I see you. Come out of it and let me go to your house. There's not a person here that doesn't completely understand that whatever part of your house, you are the house of God. You are the temple of God. There's not a person here that doesn't understand that whatever parts of your life that, is, that has suffered loss, it's filled with anger, disappointment, grief, um, whatever it is, brokenness of whatever kind, we all understand and admit Jesus does not live in that part of our house. That room has been given over to whatever that thing was we experienced. And we also all understand that if we freely say, Jesus, come, move into that part of my house, move into that room, move into that space, we know we'll be healed. We know that he will restore. And I just don't know why we fight it so much, but we do. He wants to restore today. He wants to restore. He wants to, beyond the average service slash sermon at Cornerstone, he wants to tailor this word per individual today. Because more people than not in this room can relate to what I'm talking about. You have lost something, and it has changed who you are. There are some of you here today who used to have a, a, a strong walk with God. As we say, you were on fire for the Lord. God was using you, and you were seeing things and experienced things. You used to get goosebumps in worship, and... Man, you couldn't, you couldn't sling a dead cat and not find yourself in his presence. You were just, man, your spidey vibes were going off with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And just, 
and something or something's happened, a bunch of locusts got into your life and things started bugging you. You don't know when it happened because it didn't happen like that. Termites, a termite doesn't eat a house. It takes termites to eat a house, and they don't do it overnight. It takes a long time, so we don't know exactly when the house started falling apart. We just know over time, bugs got in there, started eating it, and it's, now it's falling apart. It doesn't do any good to try to backtrack and figure out the details of all of it. But many of you in here have had strong walks with God beyond what you have right now. You have lost it. You're still his child. He still loves you as much as he could ever love you. His love is not based on merit in our performance. But you can feel... Do you know, how many here knows what it's like to know you're saved but to feel lost? How, how many can relate to I can relate to that. I have been saved many, many years, but I have went through seasons with God that I have felt so lost. I don't mean lost that I'm going to hell. Get away from that American mindset of, of, of what we've turned this into. I'm talking about just, I, I feel like I've lost my way. I've lost some desire. I, I, I've lost my edge. I, I've lost some vision. I, I think most Christians can relate to knowing for a fact they are a child of God, but just feeling a little bit lost sometimes. And when we feel that way, there's a reason. And we've got to figure out what it is now. Because we've got to stop hiding in our loss and let Jesus come to our house, and that part of our house specifically, and take up residence. At that point, there's no magic wands, and there's, a, there's no abracadabras. That's where it remains very individualized. I know what I have to do when I start feeling lost. I know when I'm hiding in something, a disappointment, got crushed a little bit. I know what it's like to hide in those things and even use them to justify some of my actions. I also know what it's like to come out from that hiding place of loss and to intentionally let God back into that part of my life and restore my joy, restore my peace of mind, restore my vigor for life, my zest and my zeal, restore me in ways that suddenly I find that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are becoming active again. Restore me in a way where I, I begin to open the word and, and revelation knowledge just begins to flow and the spirit of prophecy just starts invading my life again. And I know what it's like to get so distracted and lost that it affects the relationships in my life. Isn't it funny, the ripple effect, we lose one thing in our life, it ripples into other things, and before you know it, we're losing relationships. God wants to restore us today. He wants to restore us. And now I'm trying to figure out how God wants us to handle these next few minutes to do that. So I'll say to you, if you can relate to what I'm saying today and you feel like that there's been some things you've lost and maybe it, it might be hurt because of, of, a, of, of a lost marriage. It could be hurt and grief and sorrow because of a lost loved one literally to death. A, a lost dream. A lost vocation. Most of us can relate to loss. Loss. And how it affects our life. If you'll stand with me this morning, we'll, we'll, we'll call that step one. Because we like steps. We'll call step two the steps from where you're at to come up where I'm at. And trust that today is the starting point of letting the Spirit of God begin to restore, to come into our house. These physical steps will represent spiritual steps of coming out from that place of loss and saying, I'm coming out. You're going to see me for what I am. I'm going to be open. I'm going to be honest. And I'm going to let you come into that part of my life, that part of my house 
today. If I'm speaking to you, I want you to come up here with me. Because I can relate to this. And I'll bet you that one of the hardest things some of you will do today is to take that step because that's your step coming out of hiding. Because you feel like you have a right to stay in that place. And if everybody knew what happened to you, then they would all agree with you. You have a right to stay there. I'm telling you, Jesus is saying, come out from your camouflage. Let me come to your house. i tell you what I'm going to do, Ron. Get all my bells and whistles on back there. Punch all my stuff on. I know exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to stand in the presence of God, and we're going to sing, and we're going to come out of, of that place of loss, and we're going to invite the presence of God. The presence of God is God, where he's going, where he's at. I love this song. It's so honest. Father, I am waiting. I need to hear from you. To know that you're approving of what I say and do. Cause nothing really satisfies, yeah. Like when you speak my name, like Zacchaeus. So tell me that you'll never leave. And everything will be okay. Cause in your presence, all hope is gone. In your presence, let your fear leave. In your presence is where I belong. In your presence. I love this verse. Father, I'm returning. things I used to do cause somewhere on this journey I think I lost hold of the truth cause nothing really satisfies yeah Like when you speak my name To so tell me that you'll never leave And everything will be okay Come on, sing this with me Because in your presence All fear is gone In your presence In your presence, oh, my Lord, in your presence. Let's sing that again. In your presence, all fear is gone. In your presence. Because in your presence is where I belong. In your presence.
Oh, let's cry this to him. I just need your presence right here. I just need your presence so near. I just need your presence. I just need your presence. I just need your presence right here. I just need your presence right here. I just need your presence so near. I just need your presence. I just need your presence. I just need your presence right here. Because in your presence, all fear is gone. In your presence, in your presence is where I belong. In your presence, come on, lift your hands and let Him restore you today. Sing this in your presence. Restore us, Lord. Restore us. Say it again. In your presence. Oh, how beautiful. Restore us, Lord. Restore us, Lord. Restore us, Lord. Restore our souls. Restore our joy. Restore us. Restore us. Restore us. All that's been lost, restore us, Lord. All that's been lost, restore us, Lord. Restore us, restore us, restore us, Lord. Restore us, restore us, restore us, Lord. Restore us, restore us, restore us, Lord. Can we sing this just one more time? Just as an amen to what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives today. In your presence, all fear is gone. In your presence. In your presence is where I belong. In your presence. Oh, say it again. In your presence, all fear is gone. In your presence. In your presence is where I belong. In your presence. <sighs> Father, I pray today that um, we will let this thing be as simple as you really want it to be. 
some of these stories, Lord, like Job and Zacchaeus are such extreme stories compared to our lives, and yet you make it so simple. We make it so complicated. Help us today, Lord, to come out from those hiding places and those new disguises, Lord, where we're disguised with our grief and our pain and our brokenness. Help us to truly have the courage, Lord, not just in this moment around this altar, but when we leave here today to have stepped out from that place and to be like Zacchaeus, Lord. Let you come to our house. Let you restore and make all things new. Make all things new, Lord. Make all things new. Some of these people have been broken, Lord, battered, beat. They've suffered great losses, Lord. Today, let them see one of the greatest miracles of their God, the restoration power. You guys going to let him do this in your life? Going to let him do it? Going to let him do it, eh? right? He's at your house now, right? Now, when we used to sing that Zacchaeus song, I thought he said, I'm coming to your house for tea. Yeah, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. And I thought the Lord said he was coming to his house for tea is what I thought. And, I, and, and he may have. I think they drank tea then. But I love you guys. Go home, enjoy, and enjoy the restoration of your king. Okay? Love you guys. Bless you.